Thank you, Professor Lee. Is it okay? Okay, I'm very glad to be here. And some of you may already visit the Dejan and Neutron site and have uh, some experiment as a user. Uh, some of you may not even didn't hear about what is a neutron. <laughs> okay. So the title here for today, Introduction to Neutron Diffraction in Steel Research. There is a very unfamiliar word here, neutron. What is a neutron? And maybe you heard, hear about, heard about diffraction and X-ray diffraction. And a very interesting, a uh, very familiar one is steel research. Okay, my name is Wan Chuk Woo. Already, Professor Lee mentioned it. Okay, let's start familiar things, easy one. Steel research. Many of you already know very well. Okay, so there are many materials in the world, but we are focusing on structural material like steel, magnesium, aluminum, right? And the one is structural material is metal and a lot of metal and alloys. And a lot of material, metals and alloys, it is, it is polycrystal usually. For science, there is some single crystal, but single crystal uh, is very limited for the applications. Most of, most of material and alloys is, is made by, it consists of polycrystals. There are a lot of grains, sorry. And for the, in the crystallographic point of view, crystal, Polycrystal consists of a lot of num a large number of grains, right? It's a lot of grains with different orientations, grain orientations. What is grain orientations? What do you mean by grain orientations? So you have you have already learned in X-ray diffraction, and some some of you maybe maybe learn about uh, crystallography. So this is one 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 plane. Is it? Yeah. And another one, one, one plane and one, one, one plane. Maybe one, one, zero plane, one, zero, zero plane, or other plane. So it is a geometry of crystals. Grain have a lot of grain tensions divided by grain boundaries. Okay. So this is, for example, it's a one, one, one plane and plane. Grain boundary means in the crystallography, in one grain boundary has the same grain orientations. I think you understand what this. So build the indices of lattice plane. You can say the distance between plane and another plane we called interplanar spacing. It's a plane spacing, right? So one 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 plane and another one one plane. There is a D spacing, okay? Distance between one plane and another plane. Let's go back to the sun processing. Let's imagine there is some welding process, heat, moving heat source, and it's, for example, welding process. So a lot of high heat input and cool down quickly. But why you learn the phase diagram? Right? You already learned the phase diagram. A molten site uh, uh, made during cooling uh, due to the, uh, from the, when austenite transformed to the ferrite, carbon diffusion. Due to the carbon diffusion, phase transformation happened. Sometimes you see the microstructure. Oh, there is a molten site here. It's, it's very sharp shape. And the diffusionless carbon is distorted into the, into the structure and then make a PCT, tetragonal structure, right? So you, you, uh, you, that's why you study, oh, there is a phase transformation and microstructure is different. And also, due to the microstructure changes, and you can say there is some significant different mechanical property changes. For example, here is, here is very hard, a brittle uh, phase exists here, and soft ductile phase here, when you have measurement hardness. So in material scientists, like you guys, uh, you, you need to consider about many things, temperature, stress texture, microstructure, phase transformation. But at this presentation, we are focusing on stress and tensile behavior. Okay, some mechanical properties. So sometimes this is a real aircraft engine. Yeah, and then there is a neutron diffraction site put on the sample stage in Chuck River in Canada. They try to measure where is the stress point. Some, sometimes there is some uh, harmful stress, tensile stress developed in some place. And they understand, oh, where is the, the weakest point? 
it is about 10,000 hours operating uh, aircraft turbine. So why we study stress? Why we, don't, why we care about the stress distributions is a lot of people have some modeling, right? So FPM modeling, Abacus, ANSYS. There, if there is some tensile stress, it is very easy to crack propagate. If there is some small, small defect or a crack start initiated, it all of a sudden make a fracture. So there is some, some terrible accident what happened about 15 years ago in, in Germany. They, they report in the wheel of some stress, a harmful stress, tensile residual stress developed was found in wheel or brake disc. So that's why it, is, it can be happen in, in, your, in your life. You, have, you, you drive an auto, uh, automobile and you take a train or sometimes a bridge. Every place is, there is some harmful uh, stress is there. Okay, so we discussed about some steel research, that's why you are studying. And then something strange word, neutron. So I, I want to introduce what is neutron, okay? You already learned in physics, uh, and, and neutron is some, somewhere here. This is helium, uh, helium uh, atoms. In the atom, there is a nucleus, and nucleus consists of two is helium case, two protons, and the blue is two neutron. Okay? It's interesting. You can say, you can see atom size is about one angstrom in average, but nucleus size is, is about is one uh, femtometer. It's, so one, uh, one angstrom is 100,000 femtometer. Right? It's very, very small, tiny nucleus here. Inside the nucleus, there is also proton is plus, and the neutron is, is uh, no any uh, plus positive or negative. That's why you call neutron, okay? So why we, we care about neutron things here is red thing. Yeah? So this is diagram. So electron is, there is an electron crowd inside. Here is a nucleus and consists of neutrons and then protons. So I will show you later why neutron is very interesting and uh, very strange things, but how we can make a neutron source, okay? Uh, you may heard about fission process of uranium. When uranium goes up, up heated and uh, up to very high temperature, they decay, and then uh, the uh, neutron particle is out of the, out of the neutron uh, uranium, and we call this is radioactive decay, okay? So this neutron is go out of the, from the neutron material, uh, radioactive material. Another uh, neutron source is from spallation source. So accelerated protons impact neutron uh, uh, heavy material, heavy target material like tungsten or lead uh, that is agit agitated, and then neutron it comes out like a pulse, pump, 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 like that. Okay, so two kinds of process. One is reactor-based source; it is very continuous, very slowly. And another one is spallation source; it's like a pulse. Okay, so one impact of protons produce reported about 25 neutrons comes out when they it, it pulse. Okay, but there are two processes to produce neutron. A neutron is very interesting. There is this very uniqueness is here. X-ray is go to the inside material and then diffracted uh, and interact with electrons. Okay, but neutron don't care about uh, electrons. They just passing through the all all electrons and they hit the nucleus. It's very very different thing. Okay, because nu 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 neutron do not have any positive or negative. Just passing all electrons and then hit the nucleus. That's why neutron can penetrate, passing through all the electrons and they go into the deep material and then diffract it from the nucleus. Uh, nuclear physicists, is, is they define about, they thought about efficiency, okay? 
So how, how strength, how, how easy, how uh, fast, or how, how scattering well they try to define the level, okay? So let's imagine there is some target, and then, and the neutron comes out, hit it, and then scattering happen. So they, they uh, define the strengths of interaction, okay? How, how easy to interact with nucleus between the strengths of interaction between neutron and the nuclear, they call, they define that is a nuclear a neutron scattering length, B. And its strength is kind of event late. How often uh, this kind of scattering event happen? Okay, they define cross section. It is very similar to the X-ray scattering factor F. Okay, so why we care about scattering a cross section? Because here it is very very different things. So X-ray. So x-axis is atom number, y-axis is, is scattering length. So x-ray is proportional to the atomic number because high number of atoms have a lot of electrons, so scattering very well. But neutron is very, very different. It, it, it is irregular, okay? It is ir irregular. Neutron, because neutron interact with nucleus. So some nucleus, some atoms is very low scattering, another one is very high, it's, it's very irregular like this. So for example, hydrogen, we can compare here, number one. X-ray is, uh, hydrogen has a very low interaction between neutron and nuclear. So very low neutron uh, scattering, and scattering event is very low. Then means they just absorb in the material. When the neutron uh, go to the hydrogen material, it just absorbed in the hydrogen. Okay, so that means they cannot penetrate deep inside. So that's why neutron. If you if you if your body exposed to the neutron, just neutron comes in and then and then deposit and and then absorb in your body. That's why radioactive material is very, very dangerous, okay? How about uh, ion? Ion is opposite when you compare to the uh, hydrogen, okay, the opposite. So here is very interesting, uh, photos. This is steel, they still can actually lead. Inside there, there is a lowe's flower, okay? So neutron, can penetrate the steel, but cannot penetrate hydrogen. So you can penetrate, uh, neutron penetrate, and cannot penetrate the lows. So that's why you can see the lows inside the thick steel cap capsule. Yeah, that is very interesting pictures. Okay, that's a neutron. Neutron has a very different uh, characteristics compared to the X-ray diffraction. And let's think about diffraction. You already know about diffraction, but uh, I'll just remind you. So this is this spacing, in the plane of spacing, one, 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 two, zero, zero, one, one, zero. There are many, many uh, uh, middle indices of plane is here. And let's go back to the uh, X-ray diffraction class 101. Everything it can be explained by Black's law. So what is Black's law? It is, it is a relationship when diffraction happen, okay? Diffraction can only happen when Black's law satisfy. So let, let's look at the, the, comp the component in here. So wavelengths, this spacing, interplanar spacing, and diffraction angle is related like this, okay? You remember this one already. So one wavelength or beam comes in and then if you measure some D spacing, and you can, the diffraction can be happen and center. So for example, if we have a, power, a powder that, that we know the lattice parameter, and then one, 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 D spacing, we can calculate D spacing like this one, and then wavelengths, and 
you can see, you can calculate the uh, scattering angle, okay? The 32 degree somewhere here. So one, one, one plane is diffraction peak is happened 32 degree here. When you use this wavelength of beam, is X-ray or neutron, it doesn't matter, or even synchrotron, okay? Only when the satisfied breaks low, it breaks diffraction peak happen, okay? So let's go further. So what is neutron diffraction then? So in 1994, Clifford Schuel, Professor Clifford Schuel, got Nobel Prize, got Nobel Prize just because he thought of neutron diffraction. Yeah, it's, it's about 20 years, right? It, it's very simple, but he thought first. So that's why he got the Nobel Prize. So neutron beam aimed at the material and then interact directly with nu atomic nuclei and bounce based on Black's law. We call this one just neutron diffraction. Okay? So neutron source, when neutron source uranium is, is have a fission process, a lot of beam comes out. That beam has a, uh, we call white beam, that has a, a various wavelengths, okay? That has a, some, some deviations. So wavelengths, is, it starts from one, one angstrom or 1.5 angstrom, two angstrom. That has a Maxwell distribution. Anyway, a lot of beams have a, a various wavelengths comes out. When you have a single crystal called monochromator, that can select one wavelength because this is single crystal. It also satisfy Black's law. So, so a lot of wavelengths, and then that has only one displacing and angle. You can select one wavelength of beam, and then reflect it here, and then uh, uh, put on the crystal. So you can measure what is crystal, what can component there, about distance there. You can measure. Okay. There is neutron diffraction process. So we can have some question. What actually neutron diffraction can measure then? So go back again. So one wavelength comes in, there is some slit, and it's about two or two millimeter, five millimeter beam comes in, and then put on the sample, and then diffract it with some angle, right? So what neutron diffraction actually measure. So depends on HKL, it's 111 or 200 or whatever. Response from each grain orientation provides distinct peak. That means depends on the angle, uh, each HKL peak comes out, okay? And then grains is, you can measure this spacing parallel to the normal direction. We call Q vector like this way, okay? So this sample, if this sample has a this spacing, one-on-one -on -one plane is like that, that is normal. Normal component we can measure. So you can say, you can see here that some volume, volume average characteristic. So inside this volume, there are about a, a few uh, thousands of grains inside there, okay? So grain average, volume average, and neutron can penetrate deep inside. And if we move the sample a little bit, one millimeter, one millimeter, you can mapping, three-dimensional mapping capability is okay, can be measured, right? So one, one, one grain from one, one, one plane, you, you can, we can get this kinds of diffraction peak. Is that right? Yeah. So this guy is Tom Holden, is kind of father of neutral diffraction of stress measurement. He, he talked about Neutron diffraction can measure expansion or contraction of lattice plane, right? So this plane can be expanded or contracted. So like a natural strain gauge, okay? Natural strain gauge is, is you can put strain gauge on the sample, but we don't need to because plane is there, so we can measure plane distance. So natural strain gauge he, he talked about. So incident beam here, gauge volume here, and then we can measure this spacing parallel to the Q vector, uh, uh, perpendicular to the Q vector, or this spacing we can measure. That's very easy, right? So this spacing, the interplanar spacing, only we can measure interplanar spacing. But what happened? 
how we can calculate the strain and stress from interplanar spacing. So let's imagine there is two atoms here. Without any stress, there is two atoms here. There is some, some, there, there is some tension, so atom distance is, is like this, okay? So you can calculate from Black's law, you can calculate the spacing. okay? We know the this, this spacing. And then this spacing can convert, can calculate, uh, can be converted to the strain. The strain is uh, this spacing minus D0. D0 is without stress. So standard case divided by D0. This, that is a strain, okay? This is definition. And then using the Hooke's law, uh, modified Hooke's law here, you can put this one, x, x direction, y direction, and g direction, and then multiply Poisson ratios and then, and then elastic modulus, you can calculate stress, okay? That, that is equations. So very simple. We measure this spacing and, and then calculate the strain and then convert the stress. So only stress, uh, it, there are some assumptions also. So no shear stress, only principal stress we can calculate here. So how it happened in the peaks? So without stress, there is some peak, D0. And if there is some stress or, or change of this spacing, peak is a shift. So it is purely elastic, okay? Don't think about plastic deformation here. It's theory of elastic theory, elastic mechanism. And we can, we can get some other information. So let's think. So what, another, what other information in the diffraction peak patterns? So you already know peak position. From the peak position changes, we can calculate the lattice strain and convert to stress. And then another one is peak intensity changes. Peak intensity means it's proportional to the number of grains diffracting to a certain direction. So peak intensity increase means a lot of uh, lattice plane is, is orientation is, is looking in the same way. That's why peak intensity changes. Third one is peak shape. If your sample, some sample is deformed, a lot of dislocation is inside there. Right? The dislocation is a kind of defect. That dislocation makes peak broadening because if there is no deformations, no, there is very single, a clean uh, material, black is low, there is sharp peak comes out. Okay? But if there is a defect, that changes, that cause change of the displacing. So some peaks is here, some peaks is here. So all together make a broad space, broad peaks. So peak broadening study is possible. So you can, some people calculate dislocation density or stacking forward uh, using the peak shape uh, analysis. So peak position changes and peak intensity changes and peak width changes. So in summary, is Neutral diffraction, we can measure lattice plane is a natural strain gauge, okay? It's very accurate, 0.01 percentage, very, very accurate, or very reproducible, reproducible when you measure five times quite similar within the error range, okay? So we only measure expansion or contraction of lattice plane. Very simple. And here, I want to show you some examples of what, so what kind of uh, research we can do, okay? So part one is stress analysis. For example, residual stress. You see that the Hooke's law here is very simple, simple relationship. Uh, strain, elastic modulus, we call the stiffness. Multiply it, it, we can calculate the stress, okay? Very simple. So we measure strain, we can measure strain, right, using neutron diffraction. If we know the elastic modulus, stiffness, we can calculate stress. So go this way. So let's just think about what is the stress? What is the residual stress? Residual stress is defined as non-uniform stress distribution in a solid body when no, no external force are applied. So when you see some, some, some samples, 
it, the stress distribution is different. Some position has a very uh, high amount of tensile stress. Another position has a very high amount of compression is developed. It's not uniform. Okay, your in your car, your wheel, aluminum wheel, do not have do not have a uniform uh, stress distribution. Yes. So let's let's imagine like deformation. If you have some sand blast hit it on the surface, on the surface there is compression inside. It it uh, tension is developed. It's balancing. And some are stress. If you imagine the big one, you want to squeeze in the small hole. What happened? The, the hole feels like a compression. The surrounding is feel tension. Okay, so if you squeeze these these things inside, and then you you see that there is no other force is here, but stress is is non uniform. Okay, it's a more complicated case is welding. So heat source is moving. When heat source is moving, there is stress build up like this. Right? Why? Is, let's imagine this heat source is very hot, and then when they cooling on cooling, this part hot part want to cool down and want to shrink, right? But surrounded material is comparatively is relatively colder and then hold it, right? So it want to shrink, but cold one is is, is hold it. So the the hot material feel tension, okay? So that's why when cool down, the heat source part developed a high amount of tensile stress developed. Okay? So there are three types of residual stress. When you think about the stress, what have in the big the largest large uh, characteristic length is, is whole body, like uh, your handphone or cell phone or, or bridge, uh, automobile. Big shape, so the macroscopic stress is is a type one we call it, and then second one you can uh, think intergranular stress. This grain and this grain may do not match well, right? Some some grain has a uh, this those two between those two grains there is some uh, contraction or repression uh, or, or expansion or contraction there. And then another another stress type is inside the grain, inside the one grain, that there, there may be some stress distribution is different. Because for example, one place there are a lot of dislocations and that the other was not, something different stress distribution is there. So some people uh, study, like me, is macroscopic stress. Some people study about inside one grain, how stress distribution is different using microbeam. Very small size on beam. Neutron is about the small size is about one milli one milli, so millimeter scale. But uh, using small beam size, you can see what's happening in, in one grain. So there is one example for the stress measurement. Uh, there was an accident last year. It's, 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 it's Arabian Sea. One ship is is passing, and this container is about. I remember, okay, 8,000 containers there. The middle of the ship is, was broken. Okay, you can see here, it was broken. <laughs> so, it's Japan ship. <laughs> what happened, right? So, so this POSCO, they very uh, terrible for that. So what happened, you, our, our still can be happen like this, but, but they, they search the lesion, uh, is it like here? So usually, conventionally, they you they have welding using a lot of multipass, a lot of multipassing, and they have a welding and they make a ship. But to to enhance efficiency, nowadays they just welding using one pass welding. You can see here, a lot of multipass. It takes about a week. These days, just one pass like pour the molten metals uh, in, inside the material, between the material. So they developed a new technology, a welding technology, but they don't know what, what happened here, or how residual stress developed here, new technology in here. Because if there is some, some crack and there is a strong tensile developed and then some 
some, some hit it and then crack propagate and through all through the thickness. Right? It's, it's fracture mechanics. So in the postcode, people uh, try to understand uh, fracture mechanics to those two different materials, two, two different wells. That is a conventional multi-pass world. They have a, oh, like, I want to explain this one first. When, when there is a welding, they made a notch, and then loading, and then hit it, impact. And this is low temperature, this is high temperature. Crack propagate from here, and it stops somewhere because of its high temperature. But those two fracture path load is very different, right? It's, it's an actual uh, conventional welding, the crack propagate, and then it, it deviate. It moves toward the other way and stop here. But new technology is just passing through. I want to show you some uh, movies to wake up. Uh, industrial people called SO test. It's a huge machine, right? In here, it's about 15 meter. Center here, there is a notch. And the cold and hot hit it. And the crack propagate stop somewhere. So they evaluate how this steel is, is have a resilient, okay? Just when they have welding, just passing through, and where they need to know where a crack propagator, when it stops, they, they calculate the K1C, okay? K1A, arrest or initial uh, elastic toughness. So, for the fracture toughness uh, study, they need to know how about stress distribution in there. They need they need uh, uh, all put all the information to the design, so they want to know where is the stress is developed. Okay, so it is necessary to know the stress distribution uh, through the thickness, especially this kind of very thick plates, 50 millimeter thick, 70 millimeter thick, 80 millimeter thick. They need to know, okay, stress is here, oh, surface and inside and the bottom. They need to know all the mapping stress because they want to know where is the weakest point, okay? And then they need, need some, some heat treatment or whatever. They need, some, they need to change design, okay? So they made a long welding samples. And then here is the neutron diffraction measurement point. This is a welding line. So welding line center we call zero, and then uh, every five minute through thickness up down to 65, we measure uh, a lot of positions. And the 30 millimeter from the center line, maybe it is, it is corresponding to the heat affected zone. And 60 meter and 100 millimeter. 100 millimeter is very similar to the base material, okay? And then also we some, have some measurements of cutting it's very interesting things. When you, it's contour method, it's a fracture method. When you have a cutting, there is some, some uh, contours developed. Using that contour, you can calculate, if you measure that contour uh, and, and how we can make a flat, okay? How stress, how force is necessary to make a, uh, the flat surface. It is, it is, fracture, it is a, a destructive method. So this time, I will focus on neutron diffraction measurements. So keep in mind that in the big plates, but there, is, there are many grains, and also there is a lattice plane, okay? So we can measure lattice plane distance and calculate stress. So how we can measure? So here is setup. So that is a welding, welding line, okay? So that is incident beam, and that is detector beam. So incident beam comes in and then somewhere here and then diffracted like that. And we can measure this spacing, this spacing are perpendicular to the Q uh, LD direction, so welding direction, stress component. 
a strain component we can measure. And then rotating 90 degree of the sample, you can measure strain component of transverse direction, another component. And then rotating uh, counterclockwise direction, you can measure uh, normal direction components. So we, we measure three strain components and then put into the Fuchs law and then calculate stress. Okay, I show you already the Fuchs law. Yeah. So we measure three times. Here is the result. It looks like interesting, beautiful, but uh, here is a multi-pass, it's conventional welding. This is a new developed welding, okay? So a lot of welding pass here, at the end, high amount of stress is developed. I, I, I explained last, uh, a few minutes ago, contractions and then shrinkage make some tensile stress. So tensile, strong tensile stress is developed here. It's normal, right? How about new process? New process is quite different. So, so the high amount of stress is developed, not center, not top, in the middle, also heat affected the zone, okay? Because a lot of heat input put in there, so it's like a one melting. So this kind of information we can give to the design part. Okay, this is very weak point. If, if there is some crack or some uh, impact, crack propagate easy to from here, okay? I explained the contour method is the principles like this. So I want to compare. We measure non-destructive method, but also we can uh, compare using destructive method as well. So contour is method is, is there is object, there is a, a stress distribution through the thickness already built up, we cannot see. But if you can, uh, if you cut the sample very, very slow and the very thin wire, there is a contour developed, okay? So you can measure the contour, uh, X, Y, and how, how about G direction, how it is come out and come down. If we want to make a flat, how, how force you need to make a flat surface, so you can back calculate the stress. So the idea is very simple, but the experiment is different, <laughs> difficult. Okay, so when we, when, when we have a sample and cut it, you can see the some contour and then calculate using FPM modeling and then how stress build up here, okay? So that is developed by Mike Prime Los Alamos National Lab and then there is some company, Hill Engineering, they did it like this work. So when I compare, this is neutron diffraction measurements, this is contour method, this black box is quite similar, right? So I, I convinced by myself, okay? And second part is strain analysis. Last time you remember, we measure strain and then calculate the stress, stress. But this time, we measure stress and then, and then uh, we can see the strain, okay? Go, go the other way. So that is used for the deformation behavior analysis. So deformation behavior. What is deformation behavior? You can imagine there is some composite, okay? So matrix here and the fiber is inside here. When you have a tensile test, okay? Just pull, pull, pull out tensile. So stress and strain SS diagram. Uh, when strain is here and the stress composite is yielding and then yielding, yielding, yielding. Right, it's composite. But in terms of matrix and fiber itself is different, right? So you can say matrix is deformed first and the fiber do not deform, still elastically uh, grew up, right? So they hold it, okay? So matrix and fiber combine th that we call the composite. But inside, in gradient is different deformation behavior. Okay, so remember, matrix is deformed first and the fiber is still elastically elongated, elongated. So that's basic. Okay, that's, that's applied, that, that concept applied to the steel. So stress strain partitioning, 
in this case is DP dual phase steel on the loading. Okay, so that steel DP steel has a uh, consists of ferrite and martensite. This is a familiar diagram you already <laughs> see 100 times. Okay, so we talk about DP steel here. That DP steel consists of ferrite, the lead one, and martensite. Is about 37 percentage here. Okay, that is a kind of composite. So people think and people say, ferrite is soft, martensite is hard. Is it real? Do you do you believe yourself? Okay, let's have some measurements. Okay. So this is DP steel, and this length is about 100 millimeter. Thickness is about two three millimeter. Uh, width is about six millimeter. It's neutron beam comes in and then uh, in situ measurement during loading, what's, what's happened, okay? So when you imagine, uh, when, you, when you, it, you, this is a bulk response of stress strain curve, when you have an MTS machine and you have a tensile, less and the plastic, uh, yield and the plastic. But neutron diffraction can separate each phase response. Each phase means Ferrite, martensite, you can separate. Okay, beam is here, it's, this, this is gauge volume. Somewhere ferrite, somewhere martensite, you can separate. How? So before yielding, this is one lattice parameter, lattice plane. So ferrite and martensite is overlap because this is the PCC structure, martensite is the PC, PCT structure. It's quite similar, you cannot separate. But when you have a loading, a lot of welding and deform, one peak is go this way and make a, some asymmetry profile, okay? This is martensite, this is ferrite. How we can say, right? So uh, this is asymmetric peak inside asymmetric peak, there is a ferrite here and the martensite is moving the other way, okay? You can, I will show you the next slides, but this one is, is one answer for it. Martensite elast elastically elongated on the loading, okay? Still on the loading, but ferrite is deformed. And also C-axis is easy to elongate, okay? That's why one, one part of the peak shift and then show some asymmetric peak. This, this, this diagram is a very important one. I, think, I hope you understand this one. So x-axis is applied stress, okay? Applied stress, what is applied stress? It's displacement. So one millimeter, two millimeter, or, or one kilonewton, two kilonewton is machine, in the machine, just it pull out stress, okay? So the x-axis is stress. Y axis is lattice strain. What is lattice strain? Lattice strain is uh, strain from the displacing changes. So displacing, uh, when before loading, uh, before loading, displacing is some, some number. It elongated, elongated, and lattice strain, the distance is increased, increased. From the lattice parameter, uh, displacing, you can calculate lattice strain. You saw that D minus D0 over D0, right? That is a lattice strain. It is a measurement from the neutron diffraction. So what this is means, so bulk stress, when you have a tensile, tensile, an x-axis, lattice strain increase, increase. It's reasonable, right? So, so tensile, tensile, and the lattice plane is increase, increase. In the elastic region is, is, is quite linear, right? So when you have a tensile, strain is also increased, increased. But somewhere, the two, the behavior is different. Ferrite, it do not increase. It just, just uh, compared uh, relatively, is, is parallel, is saturated. And martensite is keep going, go up. What does this mean? Martensite is like a fiber, okay? So elastically, elongated, elongated, elongated. And, but on the other hand, the ferrite is like a matrix. Ferrite 
elongated somewhere here, it, the lattice plane do not increase anymore. That means that slips. Okay. Oh, so so people can say a ferrite is softer. Softer means it is plastically deformed first compared to the molten site. Molten site is harder and then elongated, elongated. It is very simple, looks simple, but it gives us a lot of information. Okay? Depends on the compositions and it depends on the phase, which phase is deformed first, which phase is 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 harder. So it's kind of composite. Okay? So some people have some modeling. Uh, FM modeling, um, crystal plasticity modeling, they, they uh, estimate. And then this kind of neutron diffraction data can confirm their method. Okay? So modelers like this kind of deformation behavior. So we talk about Martin said that phase, two different phase deformation behavior. I want to show here some uh, more things, some HKL different uh, deformation behavior is actually uh, working in with a gift here, Professor Kim. And in a high mangan steel, it's some, some mangan steel, they, it, it's X-ray diffraction results, okay? They have some uh, preliminary results. So they, that, uh, that steel consists of austenite, epsilon molten site, alpha flame molten uh, site. It's very, very uh, complicated. <laughs> Still, it's, it's kind of a lot of steels in there. So we know, we can calculate, uh, okay, wavelengths here and the angle here, oh, this angle in neutron diffraction, what kind of, what angle, what kind of HKL diffraction peak comes out, we can calculate, okay? So here is the result. So during loading, this is SS curve or bulk, the elastic and plastic deformed. This, this, this one is, just stop and then measure neutron diffraction for about five to 10 minutes, okay? That's why some stress relaxation is happening here. And here is some results. It's, it's x-axis is still also bulk tensile, and y-axis is lattice strain developed. So you can see here uh, several things, but austenite, 200 grain keep going up, and then 101 grain is, is easy to slip. Quite less, and also, epsilon molten site is developed like this way, somewhere between three one one grain and two one one two two grain, and then alpha prime molten site are uh, observed after plastic formed. Okay, so many things are in there. Information is here. So new phase comes out where, which load, and among the HKL. Which one is more harder? Which one is more softer? Okay, so more developed this theory. Uh, the gap between one one and two two two, we can calculate some stacking fault. Okay, or peak asymmetry, you can calculate some dislocation density. So a lot of, some people are working on some peak profile analysis. So quite simple uh, loading test, tensile behavior test, but we can separate, we, we can get a lot of information because of, because neutron diffraction can separate HKL behavior, also phase behavior, right? So still, for still, it is quite good tools. So let me show you some uh, examples of still research. So strain, strain, so all things is kind of defect, okay? So strain stress is very small one. Texture, cluster precipitates, cavity, small clack. So for that phenomena, each has a good scatter instrument. Strain scanner, orientation scanner, small angle scanner, radiography. Radiography is like X-ray. Just passing through your body, passing through the material, and then what, what, what's in there. Okay, you can see the small crack. So stress measurements, you can uh, measure the stress distribution. This time is, is issue, this similar weld. Steel and stainless welding, how stress is developed. And the memory shape alloy, 
when you have a loading, Martin size is built up. And then uh, small particles, each this kind of hump, this kind of peak is corresponding to the small uh, particles. And you can calculate how small nano size particle distribution, and you can compare it to the TEM. And then radiography, uh, you can all passing through the engine and then see how oils are moving and the, where is the crack happen. This kinds of work you can do. So neutron diffraction is, a, we have a, a, about 40 facilities in the world, okay? In United States and Japan. In Korea, we have a one reactor source, neutron multipurpose reactor source in, in Daejeon, Kerry. So this is, looks like this. This is, this is uh, like furnace, okay, reactor hole. Inside there, there's uranium, and then a lot of neutron comes out through the guide. Okay, this is radiography. This is a powder diffractometer. This is a, a, a texture measurement, and the other side we have a residual stress measurement machine. So basically, we can see microstructure, phase uh, structure, and texture and the defects. So it, it, that is stress measurement machine instruments. I want to keep point out your sample should be less than one meter, one meter, one meter. Uh, I, I, we prefer about 30 centimeter size is we prefer, yeah, is to handle. Uh, recently we developed high temperature furnace, so it goes up about 800 degrees C. And we are developing low temperature device using liquid nitrogen. So some people want to know what happened in high temperature and low temperature. <laughs> it makes uh, instrument science uh, sites like busy. Show you some highlights. So we have some stress measurement, very thick plates, weld for the shipbuilding steel maker. And then this, this similar weld, one part is steel, the other part is stainless steel. Okay, this is very, uh, common in, in a reactor, nuclear, develop, nuclear industry. And then uh, tube steel and have some deformation behavior. When peak broadening happen, asymmetric peak happen, it can uh, uh, relate to the uh, second fold energy and dislocations. And one thing is interesting is crack tip. So that we call the CT specimen, is rectangular shape, you can uh, make a free clad, okay, so fatigue, and then uh, herds can propagate the small crack, propagate from here to here. And we want to know why cracks stop, why cracks sometimes stop there, and what stress developed ahead of the uh, crack tip. And what happened if we have a loading, crack propagate, and uh, depends on the loading states, how crack would propagate, how stress distribution is changes. Some scientific work, but work, but it is necessary for the uh, aircraft. Sometimes, listen to high entropy alloy is issue. It's high uh, high temperature, high temperature applications. So we use high temperature uh, facilities, and sometimes zirconium. That is induction coil method. So some inductions happen inside there, so heat up here. And then uh, metallic, bulk metallic glass, inside there are some metal part particles here. The sample is very small. We cannot have tensile, so we just compression, okay? So when compression due to the Poisson ratio, it is like a tension. So we have some your user groups, users are from all over the world, and then user stress group, and deformation group, and then mechanical properties in new materials like uh, high entropy alloy, uh, tube steel, and also some optics and theories. So the old guy help us a lot of uh, theories. So interest, uh, you may interest in beam time, okay? So. I am in charge of machine, this instrument uh, stress machine from 2009. About 30% is, is working, use, used for my work. I have uh, some uh, duties for the, from the government. 
And 30% is for the users, it's free for all you guys, okay, from academies, for thesis. And the 40% is, is for the industries, like Posco, Hyundai. Yeah. Uh, these, these days, about 70 users visit HANARO site. About 20 subjects is going on. I want to, uh, yeah, so every user is welcome, okay? It's free. I mean, if you, if you, if you submit it, one or two very brief, do not need to be long. A very brief proposals, uh, if you submit it, I will just first come, first serve, okay? So please, please uh, check your material, chemical composition. I want to know phase, BCC, BCT, or FCC. I want to know phase composition and grain size. If your grain size is too big, the statistics is low, right? The neutral diffraction measurements is based on the number of grains, the response from the grain. But if we have big grains, response is very low. That means measurement time is too long, okay? Like a single crystal, it takes forever. And then I need to know texture. If there is strong texture, it's like a big grain size, okay? So strong texture is not good. Uh, if you want to have uh, some deformation behavior, I, I need uh, some stress, stress stress strain curve that and we can decide where we can stop and where we can measure and if you have some x-ray directions uh, we can calculate oh, which peak comes from which location which angle okay most important thing is clear purpose and the uniqueness of your of your test so everybody is welcome and then uh, email me okay if we have good ideas or I'm in charge of stress machine, but if we want to measure some particles or precipitates, I can uh, take over your, your proposal to the small angle scattering people, okay? Or if we want to um, know the uh, composition, exact composition from the powder, I can uh, talk to the powder diffraction, powder diffractometer people, and you can collaborate with other guys, okay? So thank you very much.